Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Guests and Gusto, SCAD's virtual series of conversations and digital content with the creators and innovators who are remaking culture. I'm Scott Singeisen, Professor of Architecture, and I'm happy to introduce today's guest, James Law. James is an architect, a technologist, and entrepreneur. He is the architect of the world-renowned OPOD Concrete Tube Housing Project, an affordable housing solution, as well as the futuristic high-speed transportation system, the Hyperloop. Uh, he also collaborated with the renowned film director Wong Kar Wai on the design of the movie 2046. In this Guests and Gusto, we are going to discuss how James is changing the world with leading edge design and technology. Just a reminder, you can also follow him on his Instagram, which is at Cybertecture, C-Y-B-E-R-T-E-C-T-U-R-E. -E -E. uh, before we start, we have a poll question. Uh, and today you have the chance to win uh, the book Postmodern Architecture, Less is a Bore. This is authored by Owen Hopkins, produced by uh, Faden. Uh, today's question is, which project of James's would you like to know more about? We have the pad, the Hyperloop, the Cybertecture egg, and of course the art building. And after a conversation, we will have a brief moment to ask James a few questions. You can put those questions into the chat room uh, and uh, as they come up, don't hesitate to drop them in there so that they're ready to go uh, toward the end when we can, uh, we can toss those uh, toward James and see what his answers would be. And now we're ready to go. So James, welcome to SCAD, welcome to Guests and Gusto. Thank you very, very much, Scott. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'm here in Hong Kong, so it's around uh, 9.30 in the evening here. And uh, a very good morning to all of you in uh, Georgia, uh, whether you're in Savannah or in Atlanta. Uh, I first like to share with you that um, it's a special moment for me because uh, my wife used to be part of the uh, team at SCAD Hong Kong. And it's just so wonderful that uh, the SCAD uh, family has uh, invited me to share some of my work and some of my uh, journey as an architect with you this morning. So. I wish you are all safe and, uh, and I hope I can give you a nice talk today. So uh, maybe I just jump right into it and then uh, hopefully leave enough time at the end for you know, any questions or any uh, discussion that you might like to have. I really welcome your, your comments. So what I'll do now is uh, I will um, share my screen and uh, I have prepared um, a little presentation to, um, to share with you. So let me start that. I hope you can all see the screen. Um, so today I'd like to share with you the, the nature of my work uh, as an architect of my own firm. And my firm is called Cybertecture. And a lot of people ask me, what is Cybertecture? What is the difference between Cybertecture and architecture? Well, actually there is a lot of difference, but then there's a lot of connection. We do a lot of diverse kinds of projects as a firm. We do buildings, we design devices, we design technologies, we create transportation systems, we plan cities. And it was an opportunity for me when I started my firm some 20 years ago to explore a whole new arena of architecture, which I believe was really coming. And I think it's arrived which is that architects are not only interested in buildings, but that we are really invested into the technology, the innovation, and the new trends that the world is demanding of us as architects. So we do a whole diverse amount of work. But today, what I'm gonna do is to share with you um, some of the key influences behind some of the interesting projects we have done that takes us onto the boundaries of architecture into what I call cybertecture. So the first part of the talk is called cybertecture, weaving a new fabric of mankind. Because fundamentally, I think architects are like weavers. We are making a new fabric around us, enveloping our society. 
And this slide with these eight images really represents for me the status of the current world and the forces at play that are influencing our architecture. We have urbanization, which has been really expanding our cities and our urbanized population all around the world, requiring building on mass on mass. Our struggle to balance our construction with nature and how to find that really important balance between being green or being developed to the people that are actually now living in this world where there's a huge diverse uh, kind of reach in terms of poverty to being super rich, being people who are disenfranchised to people who are landed, to the lack of space that is all around us where increasingly it is almost impossible for us to have the luxury of a lot of space. And then we have the legacy of hundreds of years of architecture, landed permanent architecture, which is getting outdated. And the struggle to find energy to power all of these architecture in our cities. And then the, on the horizon, the potential of technology, how that would influence our lives and how we build the society around us. And even beyond that, you know, the, the whole new horizon of artificial intelligence, of new forms of uh, technology that will change our lives. All of these things are around us all the time. And myself as an architect of cybertecture, I'm constantly thinking about these things. Within construction itself, which is what architects are mainly involved in, we know that there are some mega trends. One is that construction traditionally has been done by people, but this is a very, very labor intensive task. It is also a very dangerous task and it's increasingly difficult for us to build better and better buildings with people. So there is the advent of new robots. So there is this huge change in the way in which we design and build the building because the nature of the people on site are going to change. Another aspect of construction, which I think is already coming at a very fast speed, is that construction used to be bespoke. So every building was uniquely built. But I think very soon we will realize that this is so inefficient that we will be moving towards construction as a manufacturing model, where we build the components of a building very much from a factory with robotized and automated processes to be more efficient, more high quality, and more fast for our actual building itself, as opposed to pouring concrete on site. And then the actual design process has fundamentally shifted from an analog to a digital realm. Buildings are now no, no longer guesswork. We are building virtual models either in BIM or actually in virtual reality. And we are able to simulate them almost as complex systems, even before we build them. In the old days, we were trying to draw accurately with our pencils and our pens and trying to coordinate. But now we are building super intricate and super complex architecture in a very, very easy way because we have become digital. What does this mean? Well, I think it, what it means is that there is now a conflict between what we call old architecture and new architecture. The slide on the left-hand side is a typical housing block here in Hong Kong. The building on the right is something we are designing, hopefully in Chicago, that is going to be a building where the apartments are all manufactured in the factory, but then are plugged in into the tower and can be exchanged over time. You can see the old building on the left is one which is what we call legacy architecture. The hardware dominates, the software is subordinate. It's very difficult to upgrade. But the new architecture on the right, fundamentally the hardware is almost like a software. We're able to change the content of the building very easily because it is designed and built in a different way. So I think we are now at this conflict and this conflict is allowing architecture to become a cyber texture that can really influence the world on a whole new level. 
So I want to share with you some of those big uh, kind of ideas that I think are going to change the next century in terms of architecture. One thing that has been really preoccupying me as somebody who has been living in a city, a major city for most of my life, a very dense city like Hong Kong, is that our cities are continuing to grow, but they're not continuing to change. But because they're not changing and they're just getting higher and higher and denser and denser, we see the benefits and also the weaknesses of how the urban compression is happening. So I'm really interested in a new generation of cities that are going to have what I call super compression. Now, what does this mean? When I was a small boy, I was fascinated with the science fiction movies. And just like probably many of you, uh, I was a big fan, and still am a big fan of Star Wars. And the first time I saw the Death Star space station, I was just, wow. The concept of building an entire planet was something that was just amazing. It, you just couldn't imagine. But in fact, it is plausible. It is possible. And what it actually is, is that it is a super compression of an urbanized model into a planet. So we ask ourselves, what's the benefit of doing architecture like this? So I would like to show you a project. So this is a real project that we were commissioned to do in the United Arab Emirates. It was a winning entry for a new city. So the city asked for big districts with many buildings, high rises and different areas and different zones. But instead of doing that, we approached this project by using urban compression. We said there would be no separate buildings in this city, but instead we take all of the gross floor area and compact it with super compression into one structure. Now, this is a project that was done as a team. We were the lead architects. Uh, we had our engineers with OV Arab and other consultants around the world. And we did a study and we found that the super compression was able to save uh, in terms of material and energy and resources, something up to about 30 to 40% in this construction and 50% in terms of energy use in the long term for the 40,000 people that could be living in this city. Now, where is all of that savings coming from? Well, from the construction side, you have a mass manufactured single structure which has a maximum volume in a smaller surface area. So the amount of glass being used here, the amount of steel being used here, the amount of concrete being used here is kept to absolute minimum to create the volume of space. But then also all of the people living inside this uh, technosphere will commute to work inside the technosphere without the need to jump onto buses and drive cars, etc. So we try to minimize all of the energy and time that is used for commuting. We also saw this as a mini planet. So reintroducing nature into this by creating sky forests that generate oxygen, can have aviaries for birds, can have rivers and can have waterfalls for fish, was all part of the design. And in many ways, it is just like the Death Star, but a slightly smaller version built on our planet's surface. We ask ourselves, is this architecture feasible? Yes, it is feasible. Is it, is it doable? Is it something that people need? Well, the question is still out there because as we look into the future with more than six and a half billion people approaching 10 billion people by 2050, how we build our cities need to be fundamentally addressed. So I think that one of the things that we can really be very ambitious about as architects is that we are not just thinking about the building and how it responds to the brief and how it responds to the site, but we can actually be quite brave to actually propose a new model of society within the urban context because the urban context needs to be innovated as we have more and more people, as we have climate change, as we have resource shortage in the future. 
The next uh, big idea that uh, really is fascinating for me is what I call cybertecture, space-time compression. So previously we talked about urban compression, but then we also talk now about space-time compression. In our daily lives, um, you can see that the pace of our daily lives have not slowed down, they've actually increased. All of these technologies like telecommunication, the internet, the smartphone, applications, etc., even Zoom has actually increased the speed of our lives. And what that has done is also compressed the space-time relationship. About five years ago, I was invited by some people on the West Coast um, who are working for a certain gentleman who makes electric cars and makes rockets, uh, you know what his name is, um, to help out with the design of uh, the Hyperloop. And um, this is a video of um, one of the test tracks that is being used to test the uh, Hyperloop models. And I always like this video because it's almost like an architectural space that is moving at such a fast speed, it changes the dimension that we look at things. And in fact, that is the nature of the Hyperloop, the possibility of being able to move from point to point over great distances at ground level, at speeds in excess of an aircraft, means that we are going to be compressing the space-time relationship between districts, between cities, between provinces, between countries, between continents. So the world could become one city if technologies like this are actually feasible. Now, at this moment, it is still in the very early stages. Um, there is a lot of barrier to entry for a technology like this. But you ask, my, you ask me like, oh, what is an architect involved in this? Well, so we've been involved in designing the stations. We've been involved in designing some of the networks and the possibilities of how other architecture can connect to this. All part of this space-time compression strategy that could feasibly make you know, Atlanta and Savannah into one city. And that you could wake up in the morning, decide to go to Atlanta to visit a friend for a cup of coffee and come straight back by nine o'clock to start work in, the, in Savannah. And that was not possible before, but may be possible in the future. So the architecture of space and time with an architecture that isn't stationary, but is floating in a magnetic field, traveling at almost the speed of sound. So I've talked about compression of the urban space, talked about the compression of time and space. So now I want to talk about something else. And that something else is the nature around us. Um, I call it parametric nature. And for a long time, um, people really looked at nature as some kind of, you know, amazing mythology. You know, we don't really understand it. We still don't fully understand it. But in some ways, nature teaches us about how to efficiently and most efficiently live on this planet. So if we can draw some uh, wisdom and knowledge from nature to power our architecture, we can create it through parametric uh, skills to make our buildings more like nature. So I want to show you a building that we're designing. Um, this is a uh, office building. It's called the Cybertecture Egg. And it's a building that, you know, looks like a, a slanted egg on this axis. Well, apart from it being quite uh, dramatic and quite uh, iconic, this entire shape was driven by parametrics. The shape of the egg was a study of thermodynamics. Um, it really took a lot of inspiration from flower pods, which in nature, um, they intelligently grow towards the sun in order to capture the energy. But then also in this particular case, we tilt this flower bud towards the sun with the nose facing towards the sun in order to minimize the amount of surface area taking on the thermal heat. 
This makes this building dramatically, almost 50% more efficient in terms of thermodynamics than a traditional block building that has a, a west or south facing side absorbing all the heat. Now, all of these decisions were first driven by us as the architects, but then verified by the computer. And this is a really exciting way of using nature as a kind of guiding principle and then using software to verify it for a building. When it is completed, it will look something like this. And I always get comments from people who are saying like, wow, wow, that's amazing, whatever. But then a lot of people always tell me as well, wow, that is such an organic architecture. That is almost like, you know, like a, something growing from the ground. Well, I tell them that's actually closer to the reality than you think because the inspiration behind it is very much like a, a, a flower bud growing from the ground, looking for the sun, having the instinct to have a shape that is perfect for where it is and how it should grow. And I think uh, a lot of architecture today is starting to become quite fluid in its form. But uh, apart from the artistic element of architecture being very fluid, if there's an intelligence behind the, the nature of its shape, then I think we're really touching on a new generation of organic architecture. Um, so I've talked about some big ideas, I've talked about nature. Now I wanna talk about people. Um, so architecture for me, uh, for a long time in my career, was my fascination with technology and innovation. And it wasn't until quite late in my career so far that I woke up to the fact that uh, you know, we could do lots of things that we think is great, but if the people who live and work in our buildings don't feel great, then the value of the architecture is nullified. And so we should do a humanistic kind of work. So this is a building that um, I designed and built. Um, it's a two million square feet building, it's a big building. Uh, it's the headquarter for Deutsche Bank. And uh, this building is a, typical five-star um, office building, uh, intelligent building. Uh, but I needed to do more than that for the people living and working in this building. So I created a feature in this building, which is almost like the living aperture of the building, a giant uh, eight-story tall uh, uh, kind of external carve-out that has these mega terraces on the outside, making it available to every floor of the office, the opportunity to have an outdoor deck, a breathing area. Some are used for yoga, some are used as urban farms, some are used for party spaces. But overall, a building that reflects on the need of the people inside, as opposed to the architecture itself. And I think this is a really, really important element in a lot of the commercial projects that we work on is that it is so easy for us just to create growth floor area but what kind of quality of life does your growth floor area really deliver maybe nothing it's only delivering the dollars of the rental but can it deliver more and so this is something that is also very important to me uh, that, um, that uh, our buildings should be humanistic I think uh, I started my practice for about three years and we were a tiny little firm at that stage, two or three people. And um, one of my really important chapters in my own career was a big break that I received an opportunity to build in Dubai. And um, it really led me down this uh, interest in cybertecture that is also about how architecture can go beyond a building and become a device. Uh, back in uh, 2007, um, I received a call from somebody in Dubai, a developer, a very young developer. And he said to me, look, would you like to enter into a competition against two other people? One is Sir Norman Foster, and the other one is Dame uh, Zaha Hadid, both super global names. And I said, wow, great, thank you, but why, why me? And 
he said that he has seen some of my small projects at that stage because my practice is still very small and said that he wanted something that was very technologically innovative for a building. He had these two architects already working on other projects. They were competing for a third site. And they asked me, would you like to have the chance? I said, yes, okay, I have a go. In the competition, I came up with this idea that the building that I would propose for the design would not be a building in a conventional sense, but would be almost like a giant iPod. So if you imagine that a device in your hand is so powerful now in terms of being able to modulate your life, connect to the internet, store your data, store your photos, play music for you, why not a building can also be a device? So I came up with the idea that was eventually built is what a lot of people in Dubai call the world's first iPod building. Um, the actual project initially was called the iPad back in 2008. And we marketed this building called the iPad and Apple computers uh, con contacted us and said, very nice project, congratulations, but would you not mind just releasing the name back to us because we want to use it. So about a year and a half, two years later, they came out with the iPad product. So I jokingly say to people, I'm the one who first designed the iPad, not, not Apple. <laughs> but this building is a residential building in Dubai that very much takes the notion of architecture as a device into its design. So within this building, there are a lot of um, services built in. For example, the apartments would have virtual reality projection on the walls. So one of the things is that um, the population that's living in Dubai and living in this building, most of them are expats. And we wanted this idea of being able to connect using the internet, their home back in their home country with their temporary apartments in this building in Dubai so that they can still maintain their relationship. So you can connect um, the space of the living room in this building through the internet with the space in your hometown. You can see the real time images of the weather, of the landscape or whatever from your neighborhood straight in this building. So it's almost like the building is like a virtual reality goggle. It's a portal for connecting through virtual space to the rest of the world. And the other thing is that the physical size of the apartment is no longer restricted to its you know, three dimensional size. Because of this technology, we can almost have an infinite size apartment for you because we are going beyond physical space into virtual space. And then another aspect is how do we take care of people? You know, I said we wanted to be more humanistic. So we wanted the bathroom mirrors in all of the bathrooms in this building to go beyond the conventional uses by having a device that monitors your health. So we created this mirror that when installed into the bathroom, not only is a reflection of you, but it's actually a reflective window into a digital life. There are sensor pads on the floor that monitors your weight, your body mass index, your body water content, your bone mass, etc., and tracks this data for you so that you, every day, using this building, using the bathroom, is silently collecting your health trends for you. So the building is now not only a space to live in, but can also be a caregiver, something that actually is looking after you. And I think this is also another exciting exploration into cybertecture because well, a home is important, but if a home that truly can take care of you or take care of your parents or take care of a, a disabled relative is something that is so necessary now in a world where it's so hard for us to care over long distances. Now, the next idea I wanted to talk to you about is about data. And um, I have a friend at the World Economic Forum who does a lot of research into um, urban networks. And he was telling me that, um, you know, this huge neural net uh, that we are talking about in terms of artificial intelligence already exists because actually our urban environment is that neural net. 
The important thing is how do we grab that data and how do we map it? So we've been doing a number of projects for some governments, including the Hong Kong government, where we have been creating and building these totem poles that are actually data grabbers. So these poles, when they are installed in city, and this one is in Hong Kong, they actually count the number of people in the district, monitor the state of the air, the pollution, monitors the radiation, um, and actually can deliver content also interactively to the people in that area. And all of this data is being stored uh, in a central network that is able to you know, process it and make it available to the citizens. And as an architect, it was an interesting project because most of the time we wanted to do buildings, but then we realized that the big buildings already been built, that's the whole city. But how do we intelligently communicate with all of those buildings is another matter. So these polls now give data back to the new smart buildings by telling, telling the building, turn on the filters because the air is not very good outside or you know, give warning to the, to the people inside that there is a chemical leak nearby or there's a biohazard. So it can do all of this. So we treat the city almost like a circuit board where these poles, when they're installed into the different areas of the city, they are actually grabbing data. And this is a very scalable network because as the city grows or as you apply these poles around, you're actually grabbing more and more intelligence from the city, helping you manage the city, helping you organize and plan the future of the city in a way that is much more data driven than before, which was more about just guesswork or just you know, consensus building. This is much more of a data driven model. So it's very, very exciting. The next idea, lots of ideas tonight. The next idea I wanted to tell you about is really cool. I think it's really cool. It's a machined architecture. So it really goes back to some of the early slides I told you about this whole notion that architecture is no longer going to be built, but it's actually going to be machined. And I really see this as the savior of the construction industry. Um, I really don't see how we can continue to build the volumes of buildings that we need to create to house the world in an affordable way if we continue to build with our hands. So what do we do? So let's look at some of the new machine architecture that we've been working on. One project I want to share with you is called Alpod. And in fact, it's an aluminum house. And why we wanted to use aluminum is aluminum is a great material for machining. We know all these uh, Apple laptops, they're all made out of aluminum, they're machined. And actually aluminum can also be uh, beautifully finished, very intricately made, but also can be recycled as well. So it's a great material. So we came up with an idea of creating an aluminum house that would be extremely machined, could be in majority machine built, extremely light, extremely portable, so that it can be applied to any site in the world. And they will be light enough to be carried in transportation. And that transportation could be by train, could be by truck, but then it can also be by air, for example, by helicopter, et cetera. All of the things that traditionally buildings are not transported because they're built on site. Well, we have to consider all of this now. So the truck can be complemented by an element of air travel, et cetera, a new kind of very light architecture. And this is the real one that we've been working on. So this is a machined chassis that is 90% uh, aluminum, has to be strong enough to weather the storms, uh, the seismic loads, etc. And this is the actual prototype that we built, the first one. So it's a very machine chassis with uh, a carcass of aluminum exoskeleton, glazing. Inside all of the systems, like the building management system, the smart house system, the air conditioning, the water tanks, everything is pre-installed, just like you would get in a car. And this is the back of the module. 
And I'll tell you why in the design, there's a front and there's a back. The back has no windows, the front has windows. This is the inside. And all of this is done in the factory. Uh, nothing is done on site, apart from the furniture. You choose your own furniture, but the kitchen is already pre-wired uh, and pre, uh, uh, the pipes are all connected and uh, all the electrics are done. And basically it's a flexible space that you can uh, use in any way you want. And it's so light that uh, it is actually lighter than a, uh, a bus. So a single story bus is about 12 tons. This is uh, just under 10 tons. So uh, it's very, very easy to lift and very easy to place into position. And for me, this machine the architecture opens up the possibility of not having to build on site means that we can build anywhere because it's not built on site as long as we can deliver it there. So imagine you can build a house on the, you know, the base camp of Mount Everest. That's pretty amazing, right? You can't imagine pouring concrete or doing block work on the base camp of, uh, of uh, Mount Everest. Or if you are rich enough to buy a private island, you don't have to get your workers there and try to build a house. You can just ship a house and put it on the beach. Um, so, so that is a kind of uh, landing architecture that is not landed because it is not built from the ground. And it just also opens up this whole possibility of how we use our land because, you know, traditionally we've always lived mainly in urban or suburban spaces, but we can really now take advantage of living in the countryside uh, in a way that is so much easier than having to build a country house. We can just deploy this kind of architecture into the countryside. And it's just so, so wonderful, the possibilities of where it can be, how it can be. And the reason why the module is designed that way with a front and a back is that we have a plan to build a, a tower that is actually uh, plugged with these Alpods into a multi-story 10 floor building. This building is actually designed for a site in Chicago. And um, it's a concept where uh, in the future, it will be a prototype for a building that can be upgraded by actually moving and removing those Alpods. So imagine some Alpods are um, apartments, but then other Alpods are mini studios and offices and other Alpods are retail shops. And traditionally a building cannot change, but you can do it here. You can just, you know, plug and play, plug and play, plug and play. And it really is a very, very flexible architecture that is so much more sustainable because we don't need to demolish it. We just need to upgrade it and change the modules. And probably over the life cycle of the building, it is so much more environmentally friendly by doing that. And then because these models are, are machined, we are also now experimenting with the transformer technologies that is able to modulate the space inside. They are about 36 square meters, so about 360 square feet in size, but they're able to transform by these sliding apparatus inside the space to define bedrooms, define dining rooms, but then can also shift away and hide away this furniture when they're not needed so that you're maximizing the use of your space. Again, because it is machined, it is a machine. It has its machine capabilities already designed in. And just to show you that we are super, super ambitious, we are already experimenting with the idea that they are autonomously delivered by flying. So you will have AI navigated large scale drones able to pick up these relatively light architecture of the Alpod, have it flown to locations where they're needed, whether it's a job site or whether it's a very remote location that doesn't have roads or even the possibility of delivering them for humanitarian needs because you urgently need a, uh, you know, a, a squadron of these houses appear to give shelter to people I think the possibilities of this machined architecture is just really amazing. Last big idea, 
last one for today, uh, this morning, is Cybertecture, the Architecture of Purpose. And I left this last because for me, I think this one is the one that uh, moves me the most as an architect. Um, I really discovered this in the last few years and has really kind of think, has really grounded me and my work in all the innovations and big ideas to the true reason why we want to keep innovating. Now, I'll tell you a little backstory first about how this came about is, so this is Hong Kong, uh, my home city, a very beautiful skyline, lots of skyscrapers, etc. And it's very famous kind of view, very lauded as a successful city. Um, but in fact, we also are having a huge problem because it is so expensive now. It is, Hong Kong is now declared the most expensive city in the world uh, to live. And that has created a big problem for many people here. One of the outcomes of that is that so many apartments need to be very, very small in order to be able to be afforded. So for example, this apartment, which is only 150 square feet in size, and you can see it is an absolutely tiny space. It's literally just one tiny room, which is supposed to be both your bedroom and your kitchen with a tiny bathroom, is something around half a million US dollars to buy in Hong Kong. I think for half a million dollars in the US, depending on where you are, maybe in New York, you can't buy very much, but somewhere else you can buy a bit bigger, but it's really, really, really small. And that is causing a problem where people are struggling to be able to find enough space and afford adequate quality space to live. So many families, have had to endure spaces like this because they can't afford it. So they have to live in very old rundown buildings and entire families have to be sharing a space on their own. And the older people in these buildings can't even afford that room. They may only be able to afford a cage. So this is called cage living. This old man is renting a cage in this bunk bed structure and that is his whole world. And Hong Kong, you might have seen in the news in the last few years, have had a difficult time. We've had actually quite a lot of social unrest. And it's a complex issue going on here, but partially it is also because of livelihood. And many young people feel that uh, their prospects in Hong Kong are quite bleak because even with a good education, with a job, they can never make enough money to really afford a home that they really think they deserve. And this is causing a big problem. And so when I see nearly a million people come out on the streets in Hong Kong protesting, and of course not all of them are protesting just because of livelihood, but I think it is one of the key factors. It really makes me think as an architect, making skyscrapers and apartments, what are we actually doing? Are we really only doing that? Uh, and we are really not being responsible about how we use our creativity and innovation to try to disrupt the situation. And we should disrupt this situation. So I think this kind of architecture of the 20th century is really now outdated and it's not helping anybody. And so I decided to try something else. And that's something else is probably the most humble project of mine, but probably also one of my most, I think, um, powerful projects. And that's the O-Pod. And the O-Pod is a small house which is made out of concrete water pipe. And where this architecture really fits in into that kind of uh, discourse is that in this world between poverty and bare minimum permanent housing, there are so many people who are left in between in that gap. And we need a kind of architecture that is fast and cheap, mobile and available, that can be deployable to alleviate that problem. So a few years ago, um, I was on my job site and I happened to walk inside one of these concrete water pipes, which are normally used for stormwater drainage. The moment I walked in, I suddenly had this idea, wow, this could be quite a cool small house. If we're living in tiny, 
you know, 15 square meter, 150 square feet apartments anyway. This water pipe is only, it's about 100 square feet in internal space. Why not make it into a house? So I came up with a design with my team utilizing concrete water pipe to create a sustainable house for people. And this house would be almost one fifth of the cost of construction than a typical house because these concrete water pipes are so cheap, they're readily available and the factories are already making them. So this is the first O-Pod that we built. And when we built this, it created a storm. Um, so much of the press from around the world came to see, photograph, video, interview us about this. And we were completely shocked by the coverage because in fact, what happened was this architecture of purpose, which is to alleviate the suffering of, you know, not being able to afford a home, became actually something that was symbolizing the same problem around the world. Every major city in the world has similar problems, maybe not yet as acute as Hong Kong, but soon to be as acute. And this photograph that you see of this OPOD actually appeared on the front cover of the New York Times two years ago as the only front photo talking about the urban condition in Hong Kong, the need for affordable housing, and an architect to come up with a crazy idea of housing people in a, in a, in a water pipe. And I think that says a lot about all of us as architects, that we can all play an advocate role in some of those big issues of the world. Now, let me take you inside the OPOD. So this is a photo of the living space inside. It's only 100 square feet, but it's kind of novel. We're using the internal concrete finish of the pipe itself. And we've added these fixtures, which are shelves and the sofa and the lighting, mainly from recycled material from our construction site. And this space doubles up as the bedroom by folding out the sofa into a sofa bed. And you can now use this as a bedroom in the evenings. On the other side of the O-Pod towards the back is a kind of like a utility module. And you can see on the left-hand side some open shelving for your storage. And then on the right-hand side, an air conditioner, a fridge, a microwave. You can see all the conduits of all of the uh, electrics is exposed. Reason is to keep the cost low, but also to make it very flexible for the user in the future to adapt the wiring that he needs. And so the kitchen is very small, but also in line with uh, a lot of this kind of micro living where people don't really cook very much. I think there's a lot of buying takeaways and pizzas and things like this. But one of the really nice things at the back of the O-Pod is you have your own private toilet and your private um, shower. And in some of the pictures I showed you before, where the people, the family is sharing one space, they often don't have their own bathroom and they don't have their own shower. They have to go into communal toilets and showers. So it's not very hygienic. At least here, you have your own shower and your own toilet. So, we made the first one and we said, and a lot of people approached us, including the Hong Kong government. And, we, and they asked us, can you make this into housing? I said, uh, yeah, we can try. And we went to see the factory and we saw the factory with all these pipes being made every day and they're all stacked up in the yard and immediately gave me the idea of an architecture of stacked opods. So you can really create a multi-story, low rise um, housing building by using the same principles of storing water pipe by just stacking them up in this kind of uh, geometry. And they are so easy to build because these water pipes are very strong because they're designed to be underground. So when you stack them on top of each other, they're still strong enough to stay stable. So it's a very, very fast way to make a building. And they're also so transportable as well. So that building that we saw can be built and they're unbuilt and then be taken apart and moved to a new location and rebuilt again. Wow, what a good way of saving materials and saving energy, a truly sustainable architecture using the bare minimum components, but also having the ability for it to be reusable again and again. So we thought, wow, this is, this is good. This is good. This is an architecture of purpose. 
And another purpose is that it unleashes potential. So in every city, there's often this constant struggle to find land. And in Hong Kong, it's the same. But in our city, there's actually quite a lot of land, but a lot of land that's in between buildings and behind buildings. Too small for us to build a conventional building. But okay if we use Opod, because we can just slot them in and stack them up. And immediately, in the middle of the city, we can create like 20 units for people to live, whereas people otherwise wouldn't have a home. We can use spaces like under the freeways and under the highways, which are so hard to build conventionally because you have to pour concrete. But here we just slot in these opods and we can create hundreds of units in spaces that is already sheltered, but traditionally not easy to build. And we can also put them on top of existing structures like here on the ferry pier in Hong Kong and have sea facing um, housing. So the opod was a big breakthrough for us, an architecture of purpose. And we further had iterations of the O-Pod and another version is called the box pod. And the box pod is similar to the O-Pod but doesn't use the circular pipes. We use the square ones, which are called box culverts. So we convert box culverts into housing. So here is a box culvert that's converted. Uh, this is uh, a little bit bigger than the O-Pod. This is uh, about 180 square feet of usable area inside. And these units can also be stacked on top of each other to create a building. And this is an interior rendering of basically buying IKEA furniture and putting it inside and you have a pretty decent living space. So what is the purpose of this architecture? Well, the purpose of this architecture is ultimately the eradication of homelessness. If we can make an architecture that is disruptively cheap to make, disruptively easy to deploy, disruptively easy to reuse, then we have a chance to bring the solution to so many places around the world in a very quick way to relieve the homelessness problems. And the first project we're building here in Hong Kong is this animation that you see here. This is 140 units made out of O pods and box pods, funded by the Hong Kong government. Uh, this project needs to be built within six months on a piece of land that is uh, leased to us for 10 years for $1. And all of these apartments will be only rented to people below a certain income level, struggling to find um, permanent housing, and we will make this into a transitional housing. So people will live in this architecture for maybe one year's maximum three years to help them save money, to help them get back on their feet so that they can join the traditional conventional housing ladder after they have lived here, rather than living in a slum, rather than living in a cage, rather than living in a subdivided flat that doesn't have your own bathroom and having to share communal space. So I wanted to sell a little bit here today is that this architectural purpose has become so purposeful for me that recently um, I have joined with uh, my partner in North America to start a new startup. The startup is called Homedit, home with a D. And Homedit is a modular, fast housing company willing to work with any charity, NGOs, anywhere in the world, in America as well, where we can deliver the use of these O pods and box pods to your city in order to get people off the street and into this kind of safe accommodation. And we're looking for friends and partners to join our team. And so if you have time, go to www.homedit.company, uh, the website, and see whether you're interested to join our cause. We would love to work with everyone from around the world on this mission. So I'd like to end here um, my talk today. Thank you for your patience. I would like to end with this little phrase, which is um, a phrase I often repeat for myself. I, I came up with this, but it's on the back of my book, actually, my, mon my monograph. And it says that um, architecture is the technology that can alleviate the suffering of mankind. 
So what we build around us uh, is really what we truly are. So thank you so very much today. Thank you. Wonderful, James. James, it's uh, just such an exciting collection of projects, uh, especially given the organization and the arrangement around these larger ideals that you are articulating. Um, and then each of these projects become a wonderful application of those larger concepts. This, is, this has been very exciting. I appreciate all of the, the, uh, all of the projects that you showed. We have some great questions in the chat room uh, by some uh, uh, students here. Um, and I'm just gonna uh, pick a couple of them. We don't have too much time. Um, one of the things was is the, the poll uh, was which of the projects would we like to hear more about? And the winner of that poll was the Hyperloop. I think what's interesting about the Hyperloop as it relates to some of the other projects um, that you, you talked about today and this is something which is core to the education uh, here at SCAD, whether you're an architecture student or whether you are studying another discipline. It's an extremely collaborative, interdisciplinary institution. Uh, I mean, where else in the world can you go and study architecture and then have access to painting and photography and industrial design and fashion? All of that said, it's really about collaboration and understanding when and how to engage the other disciplines in the conversation that you're having. So you're having these great conversations about the Hyperloop, you're having these great conversations about these kiosks, uh, the Cybertexture mirror, and that involves being willing to open up, talk about your ideas, ask for input, engage other disciplines. And I think the Hyperloop as the winner of the poll is probably one of the best examples could you unpack that a little bit for us? Talk about how students can be better prepared for that type of conversation. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, um, and thank you for the poll. Um, actually, when I was first invited to be joining the team on the Hyperloop, um, I was a little bit nervous because, uh, in fact, I knew nothing really about it. I knew the principles behind it. But when I got there and started to work with the team, which is you know, literally 10, 12 companies um, uh, with our client, is that uh, when you are really making something that is really new, you're really inventing the wheel as you go, uh, no one knows the answer. But together, you have this immense magic of being able to collect the perspective and the knowledge and the insights from all different professions together to invent something new. And it's the same in architecture as it is in aerospace, it is the same in transportation as it is in you know, space travel, is that uh, when you're in these teams, you find that it is not necessarily the architect who always knows how to do the building. In fact, the engineer might know better than you, but then you as an architect have some insights about uh, how the uh, Hyperloop could affect the way in which people live and organize their lives from the architectural perspective that nobody else can see. Um, the crux of it is this, we are living in tremendously uh, a complex world with complex problems and complex challenges. And it is only in the uh, selfless and open collaboration that together we can really come up with those systemic great solutions and innovations that can answer those very, very complex uh, questions and all of us uh, have something to contribute, but we must do it together and we must really do it as a team uh, in order to take on these challenges. And, and I really learned that as an architect uh, because, you know, we are good at what we do, but we are not very good at everything else. So. Great, James. I appreciate that. I've got some great questions from students here. I'd like to get a couple of them squeezed in. Uh, Haley asks, uh, you talk about quality of life being very important in, in your designs, in your work. How do you think quality of life is affected in, in proposed uh, projects like the spherical city, where you have to sort of live and work uh, within the same place, within the same building? Yeah, actually, um, I wouldn't say that I have found a uh, you know, utopian way of finding a good balance of life in every project. Um, in fact, the Technosphere project where people are living in this compressed planet is actually quite a claustrophobic way of seeing the city because 
you're really compacting it down into a really microcosm of life and work. Um, but um, it was really done in response to several things. Of course, it's innovative and it changes the idea of time and how people travel and work and save energy. But it was also to tackle uh, really the climate because the, the sphere actually uh, is in the desert in the Middle East. And normally in a city uh, in the Middle East, people use a lot of air conditioning. It's very, very hot. People find it very difficult to go from point to point and they need a car. And if they don't, they, they might get sunstroke and heat stroke going from point to point. It's just a real struggle when temperatures are reaching 45 degrees centigrade there. So the sphere was a way to protect people from that heat, even though it is kind of claustrophobic and there's a loss of you know, balance of life in that sense. But, but then I think there's also, uh, actually in our scheme, the area around, which is also the site of the project, what we have done by compacting all of the gross floor areas, we've opened up a lot of land. And there was a proposal in our design that that land would be used for you know, rejuvenating some of the desert into a desert park with uh, recreational facilities, et cetera. So that you know, you've really created a lot of space potentially for people to use. Now, uh, whether or not that would actually address the balance of life issue, I'm not sure. Uh, but um, yeah, I, you know, sometimes we can never get the total balance, but uh, we try our best to, uh, even in a small, tight environment, uh, try to have something that is not totally uh, uh, painful to live in, but something that is augmented in terms of its protection uh, by a kind of convenience and by a kind of uh, 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 um, um, close community. Uh, that. That's all I can really say about that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. This is another great question, and I think that we're gonna to have to wrap with this one given our time, but this is the type of thinking that I love about our SCAD students who are already looking at projects like yours and thinking about potential opportunities to take it even further. This is from Tori, and she's asking about the Alpods. And the fact that they are aluminum, you had mentioned that you can exchange them within the structure. Uh, her question is, Is can in the future we recycle these Alpods, uh, make use of the material again? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. The, the use of aluminum was very much chosen because uh, certain aluminum, certain treatments on aluminum allows it to be uh, recycled. So uh, it can be melted down and then it can be reused again. So uh, absolutely, uh, it's, not a, a, um, uh, it's not like a concrete where once you've cast it is a, is a you know, metamorphosic kind of a, a process where you can never go backwards. The aluminum can be recycled. We can build other things with it. We can rebuild another Alpod with it. Uh, but ultimately it is a recyclable architecture. That's awesome. Uh, great. James, this was, this was such a pleasure. Thank you again. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. This has been um, a phenomenal conversation. Uh, please join us today at 11 uh, for another Guests and Gusts. So we'll be discussing the new wave of Black artists with artist, entrepreneur, and activist uh, Maylene Barnett. And then also we have Eric Valinci. Uh, who is the creator of the original Soul Cycle? Uh, no, pardon me, Soul Cycle and Peloton Bike, uh, and he will be in conversation with President Wallace at uh, 2 p.m. today uh, for guests and gusto. James, thank you again. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>